It is a wet, rainy day. You might hear the rain falling on the rooftop here. So we're not spending the day outdoors hunting today. We're going to be cooped up in the man cave and we're going to be doing some reloading. Um, a few months ago, I, I uploaded the introduction to this Reloading 101 series. And the reason it's taken so long to actually get to the point where we get the series going is basically because YouTube um, brought out some firearms policies that I was a little bit you know, uncertain about. One of those policies was about the manufacture of ammunition and it took a while for me to kind of weigh up and figure out where does reloading fall in the manufacture of ammunition and after talking to quite a lot of people I've come to the conclusion that it's not really a, a problem. This process is for precision shooters who want to save money and who want to make precision loads. If you're a criminal and you are looking to uh, commit a crime you're not going to go through the, the, the process of making your own ammunition you're just going to buy some. So we're going to continue with the series. Um, I don't think it will be an issue. Um, and the best place to start is going to be right at the beginning. So today we are dealing with case preparation and case cleaning. Let's say you've just shot a whole lot of uh, rounds out and you're sitting with empty cases. In this case, I've got 50 uh, 260 Remington cases, uh, Lapua brass. These have been fired nine times. So a uh, fair amount, so they're not new cases. I'm going to discuss what you would do in terms of case preparation with, with new cases. Um, and I'm also going to discuss what you're going to do with cases that have been fired multiple times. So let's get to it. Let's get the video going and let me impart some of the things I've learned over the past few years to you guys so you can, um, you can learn some stuff. Let's get to it. The very first thing you're going to want to do, and this is a very important step, is to inspect all your cases. When you're reloading, you are um, often using powder charges that are a little bit higher than what factory charges are. And so there's a, there's a chance, especially if you're doing the early load development stages where you're trying to fit, find your max charge weight or you're trying to figure out a load or you're trying a new bullet, there's a chance that you might be um, reaching some pretty high pressures. So you're going to want to look for, for pressure signs on your cases. Um, these pressure signs can come in a number of forms, um, one of them being you can, you'll see your, your primers uh, start to flatten out. I don't have any examples of this on my cases because I've already settled with my load, but um, your primers around the edges are not going to be round anymore if you're starting to near those high pressures. Your primers will start to flatten out. Um, another pressure sign is that you might see your, some cratering around the, the firing pin. Some guns actually, just um, by the way that they are manufactured, have kind of a crater around the pin regardless of whether the pressure is high or not. So this can be a little bit deceptive, but you learn to figure out um, what is abnormal for your gun and what is normal. So in my gun, I know that if I see cratering, or cratering around the primer that it's abnormal and that it means that I'm reaching some pretty high pressures. Um, another sign that you might notice is the ejector mark on the back of the, the actual brass. When you see this, this means you should definitely back it off. Um, ejector mark on the back of the brass means that, that brass is actually starting to flow into that ejector cavity um, just because of the high pressure and that's, that's pretty dodgy. If this happens, you should probably discard that piece of brass. It's going to maybe mess up your head space if you've got a piece of brass that's sticking out a little bit far back from the case head. It might mess up with your head space. You might find it difficult to close that, um, close that bolt. Um, so I'd probably discard those cases if I were you. It might also weaken the cases. Um, aside from, from pressure signs, there's other things we're looking for. So I know, for example, that these are not high pressure uh, loads. They're pretty standard. They, they're nowhere near max. So I don't have any pressure signs on the back of my cases there. I'll try focus there so you can see. No pressure signs there. You see the primer is still fairly round. There's no cratering and there's no... Uh, bl brass flow in the form of ejector marks or anything but even though I know that I'm not going to see many pressure signs there are other things I can look for um, on a case that has been experiencing safe pressures when you fire cases and size them multiple times um, you do get the case uh, often becoming brittle I kneel my cases around the neck which means I heat treat the necks and the shoulder region so that they are um, they're not brittle, they, they become uh, malleable and ductile so that I can actually resize many, many times without experiencing necks cracking. But if you don't anneal, this is something you're definitely going to want to look out for, especially when you're nearing like 10 firings like, like I am now. 
um, the, the cases can actually split around the neck area if they become too brittle and you're constantly shooting and sizing and shooting and sizing. Um, so that's something you'll want to look for. So every case after you've shot it, you'll want to just look around it, make sure that the neck is not cracking or there's no signs of cracking. This can just be really bad if you if you're shooting and your, your neck start cracking, you don't want that. It's gonna mess with your accuracy and it can mess up your rifle. And um, even worse can be case head separation. So uh, again, I, there's no signs of case head separation on my cases simply because I've really looked after my loads. I've been very careful with the way I've sized things. But if you are, if you're oversizing your cases and you, you're full length sizing and you're pushing that shoulder back a long way, um, and then when you find the cases, it's stretching the body of the case out. You can have a, a situation where your, your, the case starts to separate here at the head, which is a, a pretty b brittle part of the, ca of the case. Um, and in that case, you're going to want to inspect for that. Um, you can sometimes see marks on the edges of your cases around the head area that show that it might be weakening or stretching. Um, and in this case, you're going to want to discard those cases because they might... Uh, you might find some case head separation and if this happens inside your your chamber it's going to be difficult to get that front part of the case out and it's just all around a bad situation so that's why you want to inspect your brass um, i actually have a tool that helps me to to check for these things and i'll show you quickly this is called the rcbs case master try to get it in focus here and um, this thing is really really awesome i actually use it mostly for as a concentricity gauge you can see it's got a section over here at the bottom where i can actually put the cases and using this gauge i can i can check my concentricity of my loads which i'll show you at a later stage in the series but this this tool also allows you to for example if you want to measure neck thickness you can put this in here go like that and you can actually check the thickness of your case necks which again it's not something i often use um, but this gauge also allows you to check for uh, case head separation. This tool at the bottom of here, this little rod, you can stick your case inside it and you can actually feel, it's like a little hook, you can actually feel if, you're, if there's a little dent in your case on the inside, which is an indication of case head separation. And you can measure the wall thickness of your case by moving this gauge down along the edge here and actually measuring it. So again, I've never really needed to use that gauge um, I'm pretty confident that my my loads are still really safe um, but if I do get to the point where I suspect that there might be case head separation I can use that gauge and I can double check and make sure that everything looks good inside once you're happy that all your cases are safe to use uh, for another firing you're gonna move on to the next step which in my books is is deep priming now I do want to mention a lot of well most sizing dies do actually have a decapping pin built in so you can do it in the same step as um, as sizing in which case you'll want to clean your cases before you do the decapping um, I like to do it in a separate step and the reason I like to do it in a separate step is that there is quite a lot of um, residue and and uh, carbon that builds up in your primer pocket and I like to get this out in my cleaning step so I like to get this out before I size the cases and I don't want any of that carbon getting into my sizing die. So I like to do it in a separate step and a, a universal decapping die like this Lee die here, um, you can really just go for a cheap one. It's not expensive. You don't need to get a hectic quality one. It's literally just a, just a pin that pushes down. So you can go for a cheapie like this one, but you'll screw in your decapping die like this into your press. You'll put your case in the shell holder like this and it's quite simple, it will pop out like that. Very straightforward, and you'll see in the back there, it can be quite dirty inside that primer pocket. So the whole point of this is just to get the, the primer out, get it out the way so that when you move on to the next step, um, you can actually do so without your primers uh, getting in the way, and also without, you know, when you get to your cleaning, you can clean it in one step, you don't have to clean the, the primer pocket out after you've sized. So we'll go and do all 50 of these and then we'll move on to the next step. Now the next step is not something that you have to do between every single firing. Uh, I like to do it 
every single time just for the sake of consistency and that is trimming your, uh, trimming your cases uh, to a specific length. The reason I like to do this every single time is that your cases can actually grow uh, every time you fire them. It's brass, brass can flow a little bit so your cases can get longer and shorter and if your necks get longer um, then what you'll have is you'll have cases that are that have different neck tension between every firing and that's not what you want you want your neck tension to be exactly exactly the same and um, if you trim your cases to uniform length the first thing you'll get is you'll get every single case in the whole batch with the exact same neck length and what this means is that if you anneal all those cases and you size correctly you're going to have those cases with having the exact same neck tension around that bullet every single time this can have quite a significant effect on consistency and in the end that that um, it's like a knock-on effect if you if your learning is consistent then your accuracy will be good if you you know if you have your load right so i like to uh, trim my cases between every firing um, you don't have to do this as i said and you can even do this at a later stage in your reloading after you size I just like to do it before, I just like to get all the, uh, all the processes that involve actually altering your brass in any way done uh, before sizing process. I like the sizing to be pretty much the last thing I do before I, I prime and load, um, just so that I can keep those necks you know, perfectly round, perfectly concentric, all of that. Um, but it may, even if you don't decide to, uh, to trim every single time, let's say you just want to trim uh, oh, let's say you, you're having loads that you are not necessarily precision loads. You just want to get, you know, you're doing this from as a money saving thing. In that case, you don't have to uh, trim your necks every single time. You may have to you may get to a point there where you have to trim it. And the reason this happens is if your cases grow longer than SAMI spec length, then they may actually jam against the, 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 um, the edge of your chamber. And this can cause them to crimp around the bullet when you when you close the bolt, which is really not good. It's going to affect your accuracy. It might affect your your pressure. So um, it may get to the point where you need to trim anyway. But as a as a rule, what I like to do is when I get new brass, I measure the kind of the minimum length of the brass. So I'll measure a whole bunch of cases and I'll find a case that's a little bit uh, like shorter than the rest from my new brass, and I'll set that as my trim length. So I'll trim all my new cases to a specific length and then throughout those, that whole case's life, I'll trim to the same length every single time. This means that when I do my load development with, you know, over the first few firings of that case, I know that the neck tension is going to be the same throughout the rest of that case's life and I don't have to tweak my load as I go along. But let's get to the, the case trimming, let's get it over with and then we'll move on to the next step. So here's my case trimming tool. It's just a simple reading tool that came in a, in a set when I first ordered my reloading stuff. Pretty straightforward. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna fit your uh, alignment tool over here that's specific to caliber. So in this case, this one's set up for uh, 6.5 millimeters over here. Um, this, I've, now, I've set my length using this uh, ring over here, this lock ring and this piece over here to an exact length that I'm gonna trim my cases to. In this case, I think it's like 51.4 millimeters or something like that. But in any case, you'll simply turn this to clamp it down. You'll put it there so it aligns and you'll turn it. And you'll see now it's actually trimming that case, taking some material off and you'll feel and you'll hear when it stopped trimming it. And in that case, you can just take it out and there you go. That's my trimmed case over there. Let's try actually get this in, in frame here. There you go. Now you will need to chamfer and deburr the edges here because they will have burrs on the edge and you cannot just size the case like this, but we will do that in another step. So you've trimmed your cases. They're all uniform length, but you'll see that on the edges where you've just trimmed them, I'll try to get a close up here, you'll see that the edges are quite sharp. So what we need to do is we actually need to take this, which is a chamfering and deburring tool, and basically you can see it's at an angle there. Um, we need to chamfer the inside and the outside of the case neck. We do the inside so that the bullet, when we seat the bullet, there's like a nice angle for the bullet to slide in easily and it doesn't have to scratch up on sharp edges and we do the outside 
for the sizing process so that when when we we neck size the cases um or when that when that um sizing tool goes over the neck that it doesn't have to deal with those burrs on the outside which might cause it to donut a little bit but it will also come over nice and smoothly so this is a really important step and you don't want to overdo this it's quite straightforward you just give it a a nice easy one or two turns on the inside and the outside and i'll say again the point is not to overdo it if you go too hard and too long you're going to actually just make the 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 next quite sharp and that kind of defeats the point you don't want it sharp you want it to just be enough to smooth out those edges so that there's no sharp edges and it's pretty straightforward so again we're going to go through all 50 cases chamfer and deburr all of them and when they're done they look really nice nice and smooth and we can move on to the next step And the last step before cleaning the cases, and this is also kind of voluntary, but if you look at the bottom of the case in the primer pocket area, you'll notice that the primer pockets can get quite dirty. And I find that even when you clean for a long time, often the rest of the case is perfectly clean, but there's still some residue in the primer pocket. So this is kind of like the hardest place to clean. And so what I like to do is I like to take this, which is a primer pocket uniforming tool. And this one's obviously for for this size primer pockets, you have to get one specific to um, the primer pocket that you have in your cases. And I just like to give it a twist or two. And what this does is it's got a square surface over there, which just loosens all that, that dirt out. And um, it's not perfectly clean right now, but it's just the loosening process is enough that when you put it in the tumbler or put it in the ultrasonic cleaner, that loose dirt will just disappear. So I like to go through all my cases one by one and just do this as a final step before uh, actually cleaning the cases. Straightforward, just loosen up the dirt in the primer pockets and then we'll be ready for cleaning. So finally, we're done with all the difficult work and we're onto the most simple part, I suppose, and that's the actual cleaning itself. Um, obviously, there's quite a few things we needed to do to get to this point. The cases have to be pretty much done by the time you clean them because you do want to um, you know, after your cleaning, just go straight to annealing and then sizing. Um, but there are a number of methods that you can actually use to clean your cases. The first one, and probably the most popular one, is to use a vibratory tumbler. I don't actually have one of these here. I've never used a vibratory tumbler, but a lot of guys use them. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. And basically how it works is you've got a, in, in the tumbler, you've got uh, abrasive media like uh, corn cob media or uh, walnut media. And you'll put your cases in there and it will vibrate and that media will kind of rub against the cases and it will polish up your cases quite nicely. The reason I don't use a vibratory tumbler is just because it takes a really long time and it's kind of noisy. Um, I prefer to use either a ultrasonic cleaner or a stainless steel wet tumbler and both of these methods work really really well and the ultrasonic cleaner is probably the most practical and basically how this works is you've got a, a, um, a ultrasonic cleaner like this where you'll actually just dump your cases in the water and when you turn it on it will release basically like high pitched waves which vibrate the water and kind of in that way clean the cases so it'll vibrate that uh, residue off your cases and if you put if you use something like turbosonic cleaner which it has kind of everything in here to to loosen up the the carbon on your cases and to also dissolve any oils or any case lube or anything that you have on there so this is something that's really good to have if you have an ultrasonic cleaner and this can work really quickly you can you know ultrasonic clean for 45 minutes and your cases can be pretty good like very little carbon left um, gets all that gunk out there the reason i don't often use ultrasonic cleaner by itself is because it doesn't do a really good job of polishing the case and I'm just the kind of guy who who likes to look at my loaded ammunition a lot and it's just more pleasant to look at when it's nice and polished and shiny so I actually use a combination of stainless tumbling and ultrasonic cleaning I will ultrasonic clean for about 10 minutes this will loosen up all the gunk and get most of it off and then I'll, I'll move the cases over to the stainless steel tumbler, which will really clean the inside of the cases really, really nicely, cleaner than probably what the ultrasonic cleaner can do, and just polish it up. Um, the reason I don't, you know, you can just stainless tumble uh, by itself. The reason I don't is because after a few minutes of tumbling with a stainless media, you get that media 
um, or you get that water quite dirty. And then, I don't know how it works, but it seems that if you tumble in dirty water, um, your cases become this ugly kind of brown color, and it's very difficult to get that color out. So that's why I used to, I like to use the combination of both, but you can use just one or the other. They both work. I just seem to have found a method that works well for me. So let's do that. Let's uh, chuck these cases into the ultrasonic cleaner for about 10 minutes or so. You'll actually be able to see that, that dirt come off the cases and then we'll move it over to the stainless timber and finish the, finish the whole process. So let's do that. So what I've done here is I've actually preheated the water. I've pushed this TC button, which is temperature control to kind of warm the water up and that kind of just speeds up the reaction. So we've got nice warm water in here. I'm gonna add just about half a lid full of this ultrasonic cleaning solution. You really don't need much. Add it to the water. And then I'm going to drop all my cases in. I'm gonna put all 50 in here. Like that. And then we're gonna hit on. So after about 10 minutes in the ultrasonic cleaner, we're looking really, really good. Those cases are nice and shiny. Um, and the water's got a fair bit of uh, black in it. So I know that a lot of the carbon that was around the necks of the cases, in the primer pockets and inside the case itself, a lot of that is gone. Um, but if we look inside the case, it's still quite black in there. So we've got two options. Either we can ultrasonic clean for a little bit longer or we can chuck it in the tumbler. I'm gonna chuck it in the tumbler just because I like I like when those cases are nice and shiny, um, but I'm going to do 25 at a time instead of 50 because I found that if you put too many cases at once into the tumbler, they tend to bump against each other quite wildly and it can actually make little microscopic dents on the case neck and we don't want that. So I found if you have a good ratio of, uh, of tumbling media, stainless steel pins to cases, then you can get them really nice and shiny without damaging the cases at all. So we're going to do that. I'm going to take 25 of these out and put them in this. We're just going to open up the top here. We're going to put, let's see, one, two, one, two, 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 three, twenty-four, twenty-five. There you go. That's 25 cases. We are going to seal this up like this. Put it on top and we are going to set the timer to one hour on kind of a medium speed. The idea with stainless tumbling is that you don't want to go too fast or too slow. You want the media to flow over the cases you don't want it to go so fast that the cases actually stick to the side of the tumbler and just spin around with the media so uh, it takes a bit of getting used to but once you find a good speed you can leave it for about an hour or so and they should be absolutely spotless and nice and shiny it's a much faster process than using a vibratory tumbler So here we go, an hour is over, the tumbling is done, and you can see there the water is absolutely filthy, which means that the tumbler's done its job. So what we need to do is we need to open this baby up and just take each of these, ca these cases out. And you can see how just, how just how clean this is. Bring it close here. It's absolutely spotless, nice and clean. Perfect. On the, on the inside as well, you can see there's no carbon inside the necks there. I'll try to get a close-up, but yeah, absolutely perfect. Really happy with that. So we're just going to take all 25 of these out. And this can be a, a slightly tricky part because you have to get all the stainless media out. So you just give it a shake. It's very important to make sure that all the stainless media is out. You don't want that in the neck while you're busy annealing or even worse while you're busy reloading. You can see here as well the primer pockets are nice and clean. Almost completely spotless. 
So really happy with that. Get some new water in here. And I don't use any uh, any kind of solution or anything, any kind of cleaning solution in here. I'm pretty happy to just use clean water simply because this cleaning procedure is very much a physical cleaning procedure. It's it's the the stainless steel rubbing against the cases that actually clean the cases, whereas the ultrasonic is more a chemical procedure. Um, but yeah, it's pretty straightforward, no cleaning solution required. So we're now going to take our other 25 cases, basically do the same thing for another hour here. Well, there you go, guys. That's our 50 cases uh, inspected and trimmed and cleaned and pretty much ready to be annealed and then sized. Um, we'll go through annealing in the next episode. We'll talk about why you might want to anneal your cases and the benefits of doing so and why I like the annealing made perfect machine as opposed to other annealing machines out there. Um, but yeah, we're going to hit it hard in the next episode. We've got a lot of technical stuff to talk through in the next few videos. Um, so I might take a break between this one and the next few just so I can kind of figure out what I'm going to say and, and prepare it properly. But thanks so much for watching. I'm going to go now dry these with a hairdryer and prepare for the next step. I'll see you next time.